Well, thank you. Thank you so uh, very, very much. And as a, a definite honor that I will treasure for the rest of my life. And uh, I'll probably say a little bit more about uh, Liberty University in a few moments. I do have family members with me I wanted to introduce uh, tonight. My wife Connie is here, and then our son Brian and his wife Jennifer, our youngest daughter Amber, and her husband Jonathan, and two granddaughters. Uh, Allie and Sarah. I want you all to stand because I want the people to meet my family. Say hi and welcome my family tonight. We have uh, our oldest daughter and her husband are not here, and then we have four grandchildren that are not uh, here as uh, well. But I appreciate uh, them being a part of this evening and uh, opportunity to come here at Liberty University. I've got a little bit of good news I want to share real quickly. I do this in all of our meetings and crusades and events. For the last three and a half years, some of you are uh, familiar with this, but those of you that are not, I was invited to speak at uh, Paris Island. MCRD, if you're going to be an enlisted Marine, you either go to MCRD San Diego or MCRD Paris Island. It normally depends on which side of the Mississippi River you're from. And they asked me if I'd be interested in coming and speaking at the Protestant chapel on Sunday morning. Of course, I was interested. I speak at a lot of military bases and, and uh, uh, here at home and overseas as well. But most of the time, it's what I call a gratuitous type invitation. They want me to come and talk for a few minutes and then they give me a plaque or something. And I'm not totally against that, but I want to see people saved. I want to see lives change. And that's what our ministry is about. And, um, they promised me that that was not what this was. This was Sunday morning Protestant Chapel that I would have between an hour and a half to two hours without any restrictions. I said, well, I don't get that kind of liberty in some Baptist churches I go to. So, <laughs> and, uh, so they went through the uh, channels to get it all uh, set up. The last uh, approval had to come from the CO of the base. For the first time in the history of Paris Island, they had a female commanding officer, Brigadier General Roy Reynolds. Uh, about six foot four, and a Marine. And, um, and she was raised a Catholic her entire life. And some time ago, four and a half or five years ago, she was invited to a ladies' Bible study. They were studying the Gospel of John. And for the first time in her life, she understood what the Gospel was, and she gave her heart to Jesus Christ. And now she's in a position to make a decision as to whether I would come and speak to the recruits. I always say that God's timing is always perfect. And they showed her a DVD of me speaking at Prestonwood Baptist Church in Dallas, and with tears in her eyes, she said, yes, our recruits need to hear him. We've now been to Paris Island 12 different events. Every time we go, it's a brand new recruit class, anywhere from 2,000 to 4,500 recruits, depending on what time of the year that we go. Mark Ivey and the worship team from Trinity Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida comes, and they leave worship for 45 to 50 minutes. To hear 4,000 Marine recruits singing, God's not dead, will put goosebumps on top of your goosebumps. And then I get up and I... I get up and I preach, and I told them that when I came that I would want to give an invitation. I'm an evangelist. If you have me come to your church, I'm going to give an invitation. That's the way I am. And we have seen, and this is a conservative estimate, over 17,000 recruits leave their seats and come and give their heart to Jesus Christ in the last three and a half years. It's been the most amazing thing. We will be back there three more times this year. They've already scheduled for four times in 2017, four, th uh, four times in 2018. And I told you that basically to ask you to uh, pray uh, for these events. You can follow us on Twitter at Marine Tim Lee and find out more about him, Facebook as well. I tell people if you don't love Jesus and you don't love America, you will not enjoy following me on Twitter. I didn't go 10,000 miles away from home to Vietnam, give two legs for this country to come back here and be politically correct while America is being destroyed. To the graduates, tomorrow is going to be one of the greatest highlights and the greatest days of your entire life. Only 65% of high school students go to college, and only half of those graduate from college. You've achieved a great, great milestone in your life. 
We're today and this evening in one of the most amazing academic and learning centers in the world. And tonight I want to leave with you in the few moments that I have a challenge. It's going to be a little bit different than maybe uh, what you were expecting or what you might be used to. But I am somewhat different and somewhat unusual, and so you should expect that by now. I want to give you something to think about. I believe tonight, seriously, that if we don't get this right, that the results for our children and our grandchildren are going to be catastrophic. You sat through many convocations and lectures and sermons over the past four years. And tonight, let me have your attention for one more before you graduate on tomorrow. Let me have your undivided attention for just a few moments. In a book written by Joel Tyler Headley, about the title, Chaplains and Clergy of the Revolutionary War. It's a part of America's history that's not studied a lot, but it should be. It should be taught. It should be studied. This is probably a book that ought to be taught in every high school and every uh, college and university in America. And this quote, in every quiet little valley sequestered nook in New England, the pastor had taught the doctrines of freedom and preach the duty of resistance to oppression. Listen to those words again. The pastor had taught the doctrines of freedom and preached the duty of resistance to oppression. They had been taught from the pulpit that it was the cause of God. And they took it in full belief that they had His blessing and His promise from the consecrative hand of the man of God went forth a thousand separate bands that soon met and stood shoulder to shoulder on the smoking heights of Bunker Hill. This was an introduction to this great book about chaplains and clergymen during the Revolutionary War. It is an honor for me to be back on Liberty Mountain. I do have some history, maybe some history that even people on this platform have never heard before. In 1973, January of that year, I drove 650 miles from my hometown of McLeansboro, Illinois to Lynchburg, Virginia. My intention was to come and see this uh, relatively new college at that time called Lynchburg Baptist College, and I was interested in uh, enrolling in Lynchburg Baptist College. And I drove here. When I stepped on the landmine that our chancellor mentioned a little while ago, it took me from 187 pounds to less than 80 pounds, eight months in a hospital, 13 major operations. And when I got home and Connie and I got married, I weighed about 110 pounds and I was still very weak. And when I came here in 1973, uh, just like it is today, there were hills everywhere. I'm talking about for a guy in a wheelchair with very little strength, and I've got to thinking to myself as I sit there at Thomas Road Baptist Church, by the time I get to the class, they're going to be dismissing, and I'm not going to get there in time. And so I did not enroll at uh, Liberty uh, University, Lynchburg Baptist College at that time, but something did happen in that, in that uh, 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 trip I met for the first time and shook the hand of Dr. Jerry Falwell. I pastored a small church in southern Illinois. On Sunday mornings, I would watch Dr. Falwell on the old time gospel hour. Doug Oldham would sing, and the choir would sing, and then Brother Jerry, as he was affectionately known by so many, would preach the Word of God. When I left the house to go preach to my people, I was fired up. I was encouraged. I was ready to go preach. I took some of our folks one time to Roberts Stadium in Evansville, Indiana, to hear Jerry Falwell. We were in the crow's nest way up at the top, but we felt blessed just to be so close to this giant of a man. On the way home, at a stoplight, there was a pounding on the back of our bus, and someone yelled, it's Jerry Falwell. He had jumped out of his vehicle and come pounding on our uh, uh, bus, uh, the back of our bus, just to say hello to us. Some of you will think that this is arrogant for me to say this, but I promise you I do not intend it that way at all. I used to sit and watch the old time gospel hour, and I would think that someday I'm going to preach on the old time gospel hour for Dr. Jerry Falwell. He didn't know me from Adam. My church averaged maybe a hundred on Sunday morning, but I just knew in my heart that somehow I was going to preach for Dr. Jerry Falwell. I started preaching at Thomas Road Baptist Church and at Liberty University for the first time in 1984. I was on the old time gospel hour numerous times. I spoke many times at what they called the super conference in those days 
faith and at Liberty University scores and scores of times. This place to me is like family. I made that introduction to say tonight that there, in my opinion there's been no one like Jerry Falwell in the last 100 years. All of us tonight are still benefiting and enjoying the results of his vision, of his work, of his labor of love. And I still, I still feel that vision and I still feel that passion when I come to this property. And this evening I want you to consider a very special challenge. There's no place in the world I would rather bring this message. And I believe the potential response uh, here tonight is the highest in the world. We lost something. And when I say we, I'm talking about we who profess to be Christians. We're, we who are politically uh, conservative, uh, political conservative Christians. We who still believe the historic American principles we learned about in our homes, in our churches, in our Christian schools. We've lost something. We've lost our identity. In all the public debate, debates and confrontations over moral and civic issues going on today in hundreds of cities and towns in America. In all all the political issues going on. As America finds herself in a desperate struggle to redefine who she is, in all of this the one great thing that is missing tonight in America, in my opinion, is the pulpit. Jerry Falwell did something unprecedented in the 1970s, well into the 1980s, and that with the exception of a few men like Dr. D. James Kennedy and a few others. There's never been done again in this nation since. Jerry Falwell made the church the central voice, the leading voice in moral and ethical issues in America. Many of us did not realize at the time what he was doing. He was relinking our American heritage. He was putting the voices and the writing and thinking of the revolutionary forefathers back in our minds and our hearts. What he was trying to teach us, the direction in which he was leading us was perfectly in line with what our American forefathers did over 240 years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, young people, we must recapture that same vision, that same spirit and and determination that pounded in the breast of our American forefathers. We're going to have to do it, or we're going to lose our identity permanently. As God-fearing people, a liberty-loving, Christ-centered, civilized society, John Wingate Thornton said, to the pulpit, the Puritan pulpit, we owe the moral force which won our independence. That's an amazing statement. One historian said it this way, political liberty and religious truth are vitally intertwined. The role of clergy as the philosophers of the American founding is a salient fact in American history. Edmund Burke, the great British statesman, in vain tried to remind the House of Commons before the outbreak of the hostilities in the new colonies of the inseparable alliance between liberty and religion. Listen to that phrase again, the inseparable alliance of liberty and religion among Englishmen in America. Let me ask you, where are the thundering pulpits of America today? We live in a time where powerful dark forces are threatening to take from us our most cherished freedoms and beliefs. Where are the pulpits? Where are the patriots? Where are the preachers in America today? Have we forgotten that it was the Wesley brothers and George Whitfield who played a major role in rescuing England from the social and political corruption? Where are the pulpits? Have we forgotten the vital role played by early American pulpit in this nation? This material that I share with you, and I won't be able to give it all to you, but I share with you this evening is almost like being lost in a forest, and you don't have a clue which direction you should go. And then you look down, and there at your feet is a compass laying on the ground, and you can follow the needle back to true north. Ladies and gentlemen, young people, we can learn something from our forefathers during the time of the Revolutionary War, and I'm talking especially from the preachers and the pulpit of that time. 
I want you to listen to an excerpt of a sermon preached in 1814 in Boston by Jesse Appleton, president of Bodine College. His text was Isaiah 33, 6, Wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times, and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. I'll only be able to touch on a couple of highlights, but listen to this. He said, an enlightened people will know how to value their rights. Notice the word rights. He's talking about our public and governmental rights as a free society. He said, a union of wisdom, knowledge, and the fear of God will contribute to the prosperity of a nation by increasing its power. As long as America believed in God, our country and our government remain strong. But as our chancellor said a moment ago, there are people in this nation are bent on trying to kick God out of everything. They want God out of government. They want God out of our schools. They want God out of society. But I'm telling you that America was built with a foundation with God in the center of everything. Today we've lost our power as a nation. We're no longer feared by our enemies, we're no longer respected by our allies. We're ridiculed and we're laughed at. Just as Jeremiah spoke about Israel, he said in Lamentations 1-7, Jerusalem remembered the days of her affliction and of her miseries, all her pleasant things that she had in the days of old, when her people fell in the hand of the enemy and none did help her. The adversary saw her and did mock at her Sabbath. And then he said, all that passed by clapped their hands at me. They hissed and wagged their head at the daughter of Jerusalem, saying, is this the city that men call the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth? All thine enemies have opened their mouth against thee. They hiss and gnash the teeth. They say, we have swallowed her up. Certainly this is the day that we look for. We have found it. We have seen it. And then he said in 412, Lamentations, the, king of the, the kings of the earth. And all the inhabitants of the world would not have believed that the adversary and the enemy should have entered into the gates of Jerusalem. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a picture of where we're at in America today. Appleton continued, a well-informed people know the advantages of the civil compared with the savage state. They know that where there is a civil society, there must be a law, and that law implies restraint. Well, listen. How did those people in that day become informed? He said, and informed people. I'll tell you how they became informed. From one place, the pulpit. We've lost that knowledge and that restraint today. The eruption of violence that we see in our land proves that. We're seeing an unprecedented moral collapse of our nation. I don't want to scare any children in the building tonight, but I would like to scare some graduates and some parents and some professors and some of this administration and people in this building. And this is a wake-up call. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not an alarmist. I'm a realist, and I'm here to tell you tonight that we are in deep, serious trouble. Serious trouble in America. In 1864, a man by the name of T.J. Headley put together an amazing book called The Chaplains and Clergy. He picks up the same theme as Mr. Appleton in speaking about the, uh, the American Revolution. He said these preachers of the American Revolutionary War period did not confine themselves merely to a dissertation on doctrinal truth. They grappled with the great questions of the rights of man. There it is, that word, rights again. This amazing revolutionary preacher combined doctrinal truth and the political rights of man in his preaching. He said, in reading these discourses, one is struck with a thorough knowledge that these men possessed of the origin, nature, object, character, and end of all true government. These revolutionary area preachers, Mr. Headley said, went to the very foundations of society and showed the natural rights of men were. There the word is again, rights. What has happened to our generation? We've been so hammered by the phrase separation of church and state that we have allowed our pulpits to become almost indifferent to the defense and protection of the government and civil rights of man. 
These words, separation of church and state, are not found in the Declaration of Independence. They're not found in the United States Constitution. They're not found in the Bill of Rights. Yet there are people who actually believe, and there are teachers who teach in the universities of America, that separation of church and state is something that our forefathers founded America on. My friend, I say they've been sleeping on their side too long. Their brain has rolled out their ear. We've been intimidated by the leftist agenda in America, attempting to brainwash God's people and good people to stay out of government. How foolish. We've followed it hook, line, and sinker. This is, friend, this is America, and we need to take it back. The results of listening to the revisionists and the leftist politicians have been disastrous. Today we've surrendered our halls of government to the liberals who have no respect for the Constitution. They don't care anything about our rich history and our heritage. They're more interested in getting your children confused about which bathroom to go to. I'm going to tell you tonight about a particular man from this Revolutionary War in closing tonight. I brought an hour and a half sermon for 25 minutes. I'd rather have too much than not enough. You realize that if we could stir up the pulpits in America again, that's what Dr. Falwell was trying to do. If we could get preachers on fire, you say, well, I just don't know. I'm not sure preachers ought to be all that involved. And Tim, I don't think you ought to be involved. Well, when you get Reverend Jackson and Reverend Sharpton to be quiet, then I might consider hushing up a little bit. I want you to remember this name, Jonas Clark. He was a pastor of a quiet, sleepy little town in Lexington, Massachusetts. We've all heard the phrase, quote, the shot heard round the world. We know all about the famous bridge at Concord, Massachusetts, where the Minutemen stood so bravely against the British regulars. But we may not be as aware of this story, of one amazing pastor who lived and ministered in Lexington, Jonas Clark. He was unheard of before the American Revolution, but what would happen almost on his church lawn would soon be known throughout the civilized world. Jonas Clark graduated from Cambridge University at age of 22. He immediately entered into theological studies and at the age of 25 was called to pastor his church in Lexington, Massachusetts. In this small, out-of-the-way country place, he fervently preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. And by the way, that is the main thing that we do preach, is the gospel, the death, and the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is what will change lives for all eternity. And yet some would have us to believe that that is all we're to preach, but Paul said to Timothy, preach the word, instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine, he was talking about what would be happening during the end times, in the end days. In this small, out of the way country place, he fervently preached the gospel. His preaching voice was extremely powerful and could be distinctly heard out of the windows of his church throughout the neighborhood. When the colonies began to resist the representatives of the British government, Jonas Clark stepped immediately to the forefront as an uncompromising patriot and extoller of the virtues of liberty and freedom. Earnestly he discussed from the pulpit the great issues at hand, and that powerful voice thundered forth the principles of personal, civil, and religious liberty and the rights of resistance in tones as earnest and effective as it had the doctrine of salvation by the cross. Long before it was certain that the quarrel must come to blows, Jonas had so thoroughly indoctrinated his people with these great truths that no better spot on the continent could have been found for the British first to try their acts of terror and their intimidation and to make this experiment to subjugate by the colonists by force. That is exactly what hostile politicians in Washington, D.C. are trying to do right now in the state of North Carolina. 
and his governor and his people. We need to pray that Governor Pat McCroy continues to stand for his people, his state, and political religious convictions everywhere. This is not the time for us to be backing up. This is not the time to shut up. This is not the time to be apologizing. This is the time to be strong. This is the time to be courageous. This is the time to be the patriots and to be the Americans that we're supposed to be. And do the pastors listen to me tonight? If we had pastors in this country with courage and backbone, it might take some pressure off of some of our university presidents. But Jerry Falwell Jr. is cut from the same cloth his dad was cut from. Should we expect any less? I don't. I appreciate this man. I appreciate him and Jonathan both and the work that they both do. And God has raised them up for an hour such as this. And great stands need to be taken. And if the preachers are not going to do it, then I guess the presidents will have to do it. This unknown pastor in a virtually unknown town but a small congregation of people laid the groundwork for the American Revolution. And why do I say that? You ever heard of John Hancock? Does that name sound familiar? His signature is on the Declaration of Independence and those large graphic bow letters. John Hancock was a regular visitor in the home of Pastor Jonas Clark. Hancock learned at the feet of this humble pastor. John Adams was another regular guest in Jonas Clark's home. One small town pastor influenced the coming American government for the cause of liberty from his front living room. With no cell phone, no computer, no Fox or CNN news, this pastor, this preacher of the gospel helped motivate into existence the godly zeal of our American Revolution. What would you do in your town? I'm not asking you this evening to go to Vietnam and give two legs for your country, but I'm asking you to consider the fact that America's in trouble. And as I've said thousands of times, that America, there's some things worth living for, there's some things worth fighting for, and if needs be, there's some things worth dying for. Ladies and gentlemen, young people, especially to the graduates that are about to go out tomorrow, some of you as pastors. Some of you will be in pulpits, maybe soon. Then those of you that are not pastors, maybe lawyers and doctors, and maybe educators, maybe all kinds of other professions, but you still have an opportunity to make a difference. You have an opportunity. Jonas Clark made a difference in his day. I wish I could tell you the whole story tonight. Time doesn't allow it. This man, one man, made a great difference. I'm not saying we need to have a, another revolutionary war in America, but I am saying that we need to be ready for the fight. We need to be ready for the battle. We need to be ready to take a stand before it's too late. And I look at my granddaughters and my grandchildren. I don't preach this sermon tonight for my generation. I really don't even preach it tonight for my children's generation. I preach it for my grandchildren. I'm so concerned and I'm broken tonight over America for my grandchildren. What's going to happen if we continue to let them kick God out? If we're going to continue to let wickedness run rampant in the streets of America and let evil take over, then what's going to happen to the America for my grandchildren? So tonight I encourage you, get a burden for your country like you've never had before. Take a stand for what's right. Preach the gospel. Preach the death and the burial and the resurrection. But don't be afraid to get your hands dirty and get your feet wet and take a stand on the other values that made America great. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America.